the Russian military claims to be withdraw withdrawing some forces near Kyiv, but they are continuing attacks in southern Ukraine. What do you think is Russia's strategy here, and what is their real purpose? Yes. Well, I believe the Russian military overextended itself. It tried to attack on too many fronts. And while it was seemed pretty clear that the main Russian objective originally was to capture Kyiv, uh, they now seem to have concluded that that's not going to be possible, at least not in the near term. And I believe they are withdrawing their forces from Kyiv, but the idea is that they will then reposition those forces uh, for military action around Donbass in eastern Ukraine. Uh, that's what the Russian Ministry of Defense says they're now going to focus on. So my guess is that we're going to see those Russian forces now move and then go back into action in eastern Ukraine. We have seen that the Russian military continues to kill civilians. Do you think it's an order from President Putin? Yes. If yes, what is he trying to achieve by killing civilians? Yeah. Well, I don't know if there is a direct order from Mr. Putin to the military to kill civilians, but it's widespread. I mean, you've seen the indiscriminate shelling of Mariupol. You've seen indiscriminate shelling of Chernihiv in northern eastern Ukraine, of Kharkiv in northeastern Ukraine. And now you've seen these horrific pictures coming out of some of the small towns north of Kyiv, uh, where civilians were executed, apparently. Uh, and it's so widespread, I mean, it, it really it's not a question whether Mr. Putin gave a direct order or not. He's the commander of chief in Russian forces. He bears responsibility. And we've seen no sign that he's tried to tell Russian forces to behave according to the laws of war. And we've seen no sign that he's called for investigations of the atrocities that Russian forces are committing. Mm -hmm. So he bears responsibility. Mm -hmm. What do you think about his, um, President Putin's political goals? Yeah, I believe that he wants to win some kind of a military victory uh, because I don't yet see a serious negotiating approach. The Russians are talking to the Ukrainians, uh, but there doesn't seem to be any real give and take approach from the Russian side. Now, originally it appeared that the Russians were hoping to capture and occupy perhaps the eastern two thirds of Ukraine. Everything east of a line from Kiev in the north down to Odessa in the uh, south. But it also appears that the, Ukraine, the Russian military has grossly underestimated and the Kremlin has underestimated just how hard the Ukrainians would fight back. And so it may be now that the Russians are downsizing their goals because they recognize they cannot achieve their original objectives. And at least now they say their near-term goal is to capture more of the Donbass area in, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, now, whether that will be enough for Mr. Putin then to say he's achieved a political objective, we don't know. But thus far, unfortunately, it appears the Russians are still focusing on winning this conflict on the battlefield, winning this war on the battlefield, and they're not yet prepared for a serious negotiation. Uh, some people pointed out that there has been little progress in ne nego negotiating between Russia and Ukraine. What is your view on what, how the negotiation is going? Well, it seems to me that for the last several weeks, Ukrainian President Zelensky has suggested that he's prepared to adjust some Ukrainian positions to address Russian concerns. So for example, he has talked about accepting neutrality, that Ukraine would give up its uh, ambition to try to join NATO, but would accept neutrality, uh, non-bloc status, uh, would not accept foreign bases on its territory. Uh, but unfortunately, you've not seen any real give on the Russian side. I mean, the Russians have maximalist demands and it's not at all apparent that the Russians have moved from those demands, even though I think it's become clear that the military uh, effort to occupy a good part of Ukraine is not going to succeed on the Russian part. So until you get both sides wanting the negotiation, uh, it's hard to see progress being made. And uh, again, when you look at what the Kremlin says, the Kremlin spokesman, Mr. Peskov, you know, he doesn't seem to, um, 
uh, be talking in terms of a Kremlin that actually wants a negotiated settlement. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think needs to be done to end this war? Well, to end the war uh, again, it will be necessary, I believe, to get the Russians to negotiate seriously, and that probably does not happen unless the Russian army suffers more military setbacks. So I, I very much hope that the United States and the West will continue to provide arms to the Ukrainians so they can better defend themselves because Ukraine's effort to defend against the Russian attacks and to push back against the Russians, and we've seen some Ukrainian counterattacks where they're now liberating areas that previously were held by the Russian military. To the extent that the Ukrainian military is more successful, that may accelerate the point at which the Kremlin is ready for a serious negotiation. Uh, but unfortunately, that means that the fighting is going to have to go on for some time to come before you get to that point where a ceasefire and serious negotiations may be possible. There are voices from many countries saying Russia has committed, committed war crimes. What is the impact of such public opinion on Russia? Uh, well, it's hard to say the public opinion, how it impacts public opinion within Russia, because the Kremlin has very tight control over the information space, the televisions, the, the main uh, newspapers and such, and it has closed the space for social media. So there may be a lot of Russians who are not aware of the war crimes that the Russian military has committed in their name. Uh, and so we don't yet see, I think, an impact on that. Polls show that um, Russians support what President Putin is doing in Ukraine. Uh, my guess is that as they learn more about the war and as they see increasing numbers of Russian casualties, the American estimate now is more than 10,000 Russian soldiers have been killed in action in Ukraine. And as they begin to face the economic consequences of the sanctions, Maybe that will change the view of some of the, uh, the Russian population. But on the flip side, I think the impact of these war crimes is to harden attitudes in the West, that you're now looking in the United States and Europe, looking now to apply even further sanctions on Russia and probably looking to accelerate arms to Ukraine because of just the horrific nature of what we're seeing coming out of Ukraine uh, when the Russian military either attacks a city such as Mariupol and then the horrors that come after a Russian occupation of towns in Ukraine. Some people say that Putin has been misinformed by his advisors. Uh, do you think Putin would have re uh, reacted differently if he had better information? And should we take his nuclear threats seriously? It's an excellent question about the information that gets to Mr. Putin. You know, we have seen going back for years that he operates in a very small inner circle. And most of the people in that inner circle, like Putin himself, come from the security services. So they have a similar worldview, a similar outlook. And from what we've seen in the past two years, uh, the Kremlin has taken extraordinary precautions to protect Putin against uh, uh, COVID-19. And so you've seen that small circle perhaps getting even smaller my concern is that he gets a very narrow channel of information and he's not getting you know there's a question is he getting the correct information from the russian military about just how hard this war is i don't know but my guess is that in that kind of system there's probably a lot of reluctance to give putin bad news likewise if you look at the head of the russian central bank or the Russian Minister of Finance, these are very smart people when it comes to economists. They know just how bad the sanctions are going to affect the Russian economy in the coming months. But from what we've seen in that the past six weeks, I don't think they've had a chance even to meet with Putin. So I, I do worry that he's getting a very narrow share channel of information. And in some cases, because people don't want to give him bad news, it's probably distorted information. That worries me because to the extent he has bad information, he may make bad decisions going forward. You mentioned in your recent commentary that one of Russia's demand is Ukraine's neutrality, but Ukraine would want security guarantees in return. 
What yeah. kind of assurance do you think America and West co Western countries are willing to provide for Ukraine uh, this time? And c what kind of approach should the U.S. take to help end the war? I think in terms of ending the war, the United States should basically follow the Ukrainian lead. President Zelensky has to make some tough decisions about negotiations. I think the United States and the West should be supportive of Zelensky and really let Zelensky take those tough decisions. We shouldn't be pushing him to take a bad deal and we shouldn't be pushing him to reject a deal that he concludes uh, is in Ukraine's interest. Uh, now, there are some issues where I think the United States should advise the Ukrainians of its views because the United States could be directly involved and one of those questions would be this issue of security guarantees. Because President Zelensky, the Ukrainian position is that they would accept neutrality, but they want security guarantees from other countries on a bilateral basis that seem to be basically a guarantee that should a neutral Ukraine have its territorial integrity violated again, should there be a further Russian invasion, that those countries would come and to defend Ukraine. It's almost like having an Article 5 guarantee from NATO, but having it from countries on a bilateral basis. That's going to be a really hard question for Western countries. For the United States, I'm not sure where the Biden administration would come down on that in the end. It wants to be supportive of ending the war, but is it prepared to make that kind of commitment to go to war potentially against Russia? And that kind of guarantee would undoubtedly require approval uh, as a treaty, would that kind of guarantee be able to get two thirds votes in the Senate for advice and consent to ratification? Uh, so there are very hard questions there. I, I think my own view is that uh, as, as Ukraine goes forward, it wants to maintain an ability to continue, it, have the ability to maintain a strong military, you know, no demilitarization, and then the ability to, to receive weapons from the West because the best security guarantee for Ukraine is a Ukrainian military that is strong enough to defend Ukraine and is visibly strong enough so that the Russians would never consider an invasion like this again. Japan has been reluctant to accept refugees, but today Japan is accepting refugees from Ukraine for the first time. What do you think about these Japanese actions? I think the Japanese government has taken a number of actions in the last four or five weeks uh, that, uh, that merit praise. Uh, the decision to take in some Ukrainian refugees, Japan is also providing, I don't think it's lethal military assistance, but Japan has already begun providing Ukraine with some defense assistance. Uh, and Japan has basically applied some serious sanctions on Russia. So I, I think Japan is, is contributing in a very positive way uh, to trying to promote an end to this conflict that also protects Ukrainian interests. Uh, and also I think it's valuable because to the extent that the Russians see just how many countries around the world, it's not just the United States and Europe, there are countries, there's Japan, there's Australia, there are countries around the world that are sanctioning Russia, that are providing arms and defensive supplies to uh, Ukraine. That's a good political message. And again, what we're trying to do here, uh, and, and Japan has been helping, is affect the calculation in the Kremlin so that one man, Vladimir Putin, who launched this war, a war of choice that was totally unnecessary, at the end concludes that the costs have become so high that he needs to find a negotiated way out and end the war.